Hi, welcome in. My name is Ro. I'm a project manager, content creator, and healthy productivity fanatic. And in today's video, we are going to do a little content creation Q&A. I recently hit 10,000 subscribers on my other YouTube channel, which at this point actually already went up to 12,000, which is absolutely bonkers. So I thought it would be a really fun milestone to do a little Q&A about how I got into content creation, what I use, all of those things. So feel free to come along for the ride. I've kind of split up this video in a couple of parts because I put out a little call for questions and you guys absolutely blew me away with the amount of questions and also the thoughtfulness of the questions. So I kind of tried to bundle them together. If you are curious about like a little bit more of the Sims side of things, I have also made a speed build slash Q&A video on my Sims channel where I answer specifically Sims related questions. And then this one is just going to be about content creation because it made sense to split them up a little bit. Otherwise I would get one video that kind of went all over the place. So in today's video, I actually split it up in a couple of different segments. So first we have a couple of questions about starting content creation. Then there is a little bit about practicalities and how I do it. Then there is a little bit about my experience being a content creator. Then there is a chunk about time management and planning, which I am very excited to get into because if you know this channel and you know me a little bit, that's a topic that I'm very passionate about. Then there's a little segment about live streaming. Because I don't just create content on YouTube. I also do live streaming. Then after the live streaming, it's followed up by a bunch of questions about strategies. So I'll just try to share my two cents about these questions that you asked. Obviously, I am definitely not the only content creator out there and everyone does it differently, but these would be my strategies for creating content. And then there's like just three very random questions that you guys asked that I also want to make sure to answer all the way at the end of the video. So uh, let's just dive right into it. And actually, I think this was the most asked question is why did you start making YouTube videos? What got me into content creation? What got me into live streaming? And um, that's actually a little bit of a story time. I'm going to try to keep this video not extremely long. I don't want to bore you with like an hour of me yapping. So I'll try to keep my answers a bit short, but this one we do have to start with the story time. So in 2019, I actually was at home with a burnout. I didn't get to work for about nine months. And during that time, I started playing The Sims because I hadn't played The Sims since I was very young. Well, very young since in like my teenage years, I would say. And I kind of picked it back up. And obviously, because I was new to the game at that point, I started watching a bunch of YouTube tutorials to kind of learn how to play the game. Somewhere within that time period, there was this kind of itch to also do something with that. I don't exactly know, or like I can't really pinpoint the exact moment that I was like, oh yeah, I really want to start creating content. But I got very inspired by people that I watched on YouTube. And the more I started watching it, I also started watching live streams. And kind of from there, I realized that that was something that I would love to try. At that point, I had been struggling in my main job for a while that I was kind of missing the creative aspect of things. I'm a project manager, which I very much enjoy, but I, it wasn't really fulfilling everything that I wanted to do. And then I was like, you know what? I'm just going to give it a go. Obviously, I started playing The Sims in 2019. I only started creating content in 2021. So there's like actually a two year gap between that. That's also because... To be completely honest, at first, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but also when I was kind of thinking about maybe starting to create content, obviously I had, I think the exact same fear that everyone had is, will I be any good at it? Where do I start? I, I have no clue what, what to buy, what to do. I watched a bunch of YouTube videos just like this one to kind of get me going, kind of get me into the mindset of what would I need and how would I approach all of this? I would say first I played The Sims for a year without thinking about content creation, but like, I think it took me a full year to get from the first first time that I thought about potentially doing it to actually creating my first YouTube video. Then there is one question is, what is the most important advice you would like to give your past self when I was just starting out as a content creator? I find this a really hard one because I don't like, obviously I've had many lessons learned along the way, but none of those lessons learned, I would like kind of want to know ahead already because I feel like I learned them at the right time. So I think if I had to answer this question, it would be, don't worry, you're doing it right. Like just enjoy the journey because I've definitely had days where I worried so much about my statistics and my analytics and whether I was making the right choices. And, you know, I've had my fair share of worry. I think as any content creator can relate to that. Um, and I would like to just tell my younger, se younger self, two years, three years ago self, hey, you're doing all right. Don't worry. You're, you're on the right track. I think that moves us on to the next section and that is how to do it. And then one question that got asked a bunch of time is what equipments and what programs do you use? And um, are they my favorite or would I prefer to have some 
something else. And then also like which equipment would you recommend? I think for the things that I use, I mostly actually use software that is free. So I use DaVinci Resolve for editing. I use OBS for recording and streaming. And I use Notion for basically all my admin stuff. If you're familiar with this channel, you'll probably know that. Um, and I also use Canva for all of my graphics. All of those have a free version. I think all of those also have a paid version or at least like a version that you can support. I know for OBS, I think you can support them through Patreon, um, but I use most of them for free. Canva and Notion are the ones that I pay for, but that's also because I use them even outside of my content creation job. If I had to recommend anything to anyone wanting to do content creation is start with free apps. There's literally no use in like starting to pay for uh, Adobe Premiere or any expensive like Photoshop or something when there's tools out there that they can do it just as well for free. Like don't start paying for things you don't need. And if you are, say, saving up a little bit of money and you want to invest in something, start with buying a mic because it is much easier to create content without a camera or without a good camera because people can accept shitty camera quality if your game quality is good and if your sound is good. Terrible sound is like the number one killer for your content because people will click on your video or click on your stream, hear it and immediately click off because it sounds terrible. If you were to do an investment in the streaming, please, the first one, definitely go for something like a microphone. Of course, assuming that you have a PC that allows you to already record or stream from. Otherwise, maybe start there because otherwise your microphone is not gonna do that much for you. Keep in mind that this doesn't have to be expensive. There is really good USB microphones out there and a really big part of a microphone sounding good is not due to it being a good microphone. Of course, that contributes to it as well, but also how you set it up, how close you have it to your mouth, all of those things that are incredibly important when setting up sound. So don't think that you have to break your bank for a microphone. You can definitely start out with something that's like 50, 60 bucks and make sure that it sounds decent enough for people not to click off your content. Then someone actually asked, what is your most used or favorite stream that deck function and this is such a fun question because i love my stream deck i love my stream deck setup and i think i actually have one that it's called multi-actions and basically what it allows you to do on your stream deck is um for those of you who don't know what a stream deck is by the way i'll put a picture up on the screen it's basically like a little button device where you can program the buttons to do all kinds of things on your pc uh, i can turn on my lights on and off i can start my recording i can stop my recording there's like a bunch of things that i can do with just a push of a button and there is one thing that is called a multi-action specifically the multi-action switch because that's just great it allows you with the one press of a button to do a certain amount of things and as soon as you press that same button again it will reverse it or do it in another order for me personally i use this a ton when it comes to streaming for instance when i go to my be right back screen on stream it automatically mute my mutes my mic it hides my subtitles so if my mic still picks up sound it doesn't show the subtitles on screen uh, whenever i do my co-working streams i make sure that that whenever I start the focus time, the music automatically gets louder. Like I try to automate as much as I can and multi-actions and multi-action switches on Stream Deck are literally amazing for this. It is so incredibly useful to be able to program multiple steps under just one button press because it makes the whole flow of your stream so much easier because you only need to think about setting up something once. And then every single time you press the button, you can just lean back and relax and you don't have to like think about, oh, did I mute myself? Did I turn this off? Did I turn that on? Like it's just one press of a button and that's it. And it's so incredibly helpful for, I even have it for recording. Like when I, I have one button on my stream deck that when I press it, it opens up all my recording software in one go. Super easy. Then someone asks, how did you set up your mic in OBS? It sounds so neat. And I'm afraid I have a little bit of a shitty answer for this. And that is that in my OBS, I didn't do anything special. I will link a video down below, which is my absolute all time favorite video for when it comes to setting up your microphone, because that person explains it super clearly on how to set up your filters and stuff. But there is obviously a difference in quality of microphones. This is relatively an expensive microphone. It's almost 300 euros. And the polar pattern of this microphone is designed to pick up the sound at the front of the mic. And it is really close to my mouth. Like literally, if I lean a little bit forward, I'm touching the mic with my lips. That also helps a lot in it picking up less room sound, it just picking up my voice. This mic is very much like a podcasty mic. The polar pattern, like I said again, is designed to pick it up from the top, which actually prevents a lot of room sound from also picking up. I do have some filters on this microphone in the native software of the mic. I have a noise suppressor and an expander and a compressor on this. So if you are wondering what all of those are, the video in the description will explain this really well. You can put those filters on your mic in OBS as well, but 
in case of my mic, it's literally in my OBS. It's just plug and play. But thanks for thinking that my mic sounds good. I appreciate that. <laughs> then the next question is, how do you create your thumbnails? Which programs do you use? Is there a beginner friendly option? Again, I feel like I've already kind of covered this because I mentioned Canva before, but I create all of my thumbnails in Canva. This is definitely something that when I look back at my older thumbnails, I, I see a huge, <laughs> tremendous amount of growth in the skill of designing thumbnails and like having an eye for what works and what doesn't work. But just know that that is something that you can learn to. It's just literally learning by doing. Create more and more thumbnails, see what works, see what other people are doing, and Canva can do it all. So you really don't have to worry about needing expensive expensive software for this. There's also a bunch of great Canva tutorials out there on YouTube. So if you're like new to the software, there's so many people out there that just give you great free advice. And then the last one in this category is any tips in general for someone new to content creation. And I think my main tip would be is don't start doing this with the hopes of getting rich really quickly or creating passive income. Because I think when I look at the amount of hours I work for content creation, this is the least passive I've ever been in my life. So it's don't do it for thinking that you're going to get famous or you're going to get really rich because those are not the right reasons to start creating content. If you do it, do it because you love it, because you love the process of creating, because you love the process of interaction with people, because you love teaching people, like make sure that there is an element that you genuinely love about content creation because that's the thing that's going to keep you going when you feel burned out or when you're struggling and also if you start doing it just experiment don't worry about too much about will i love it will i find it amazing will i be good at it just start and then see if you like it because i think too many people get in their heads and think a lot about whether they should be creating content and because they think about it so much they never do it and then once they finally make their first video they realize they don't actually love it that as much and then they feel like they wasted a lot of time thinking about it so just try it out and if you realize that you don't love it that's also completely valid and completely fine then we're going to move on to the next category which is experience being a content content creator. And sometimes I still think it is so silly to call myself a content creator. So this is going to be an interesting one because sometimes some days I even forget that that's like my experience now uh, for three years already, actually. Um, and the first question is, do you ever experience burnout? And if so, how do you find motivation to keep creating content? I think I already kind of briefly touched upon this in the previous question, but absolutely. I definitely experienced burnout. I have for sure have had my ups and downs in creating content in the past three years. I've had moments where I felt incredibly motivated and moments where I kind of felt like uninspired or maybe not really motivated to do a specific activity. So I was like, I want to edit, but first I need to record and I really don't want to record right now. I think my main tips would be be kind with yourself. If you notice that you are not in a mood for recording, see if you can shuffle some things around. There's always plenty of work to do. So if you notice yourself not being in the mood for a specific activity, see if you can free up your schedule so you can do that at another time. Obviously that won't be possible always, but don't force yourself to do things because that will just make Make yourself hate that activity more or feel like not like it even more and then it will just become harder over time and also how to find the motivation i think that gets back to the question that i answered earlier is you have to be in this because you love it so for me whenever i feel like i am unmotivated or i'm experiencing a bit of a burnout on a game or maybe i'm worried about my viewership on twitch or maybe i worry about three videos in a row not performing very well on my channel that's the point where i have to really search within myself and go back to why did i start doing this because i started it for zero subscribers there were zero viewers in my Twitch stream. There were zero subscribers on my YouTube channel. And still, I wanted to make that first video. Like, what was that spark in me that wanted me to start doing this? And then when I go back to that, I realize actually it doesn't matter if your videos do well because you're making it because you enjoy the process of making videos. And that's the point where once I come back to that feeling, I usually refine like at least enough motivation to get started again. Then the next question is, what is something you overestimated and something you underestimated about your job when you first started or maybe even now. And then there's also a question of like, what do you think other people are over and underestimating? So for underestimating, I think the amount of time that goes into this, um, I think I didn't realize how much time I would also spend on not even creating things, but just doing admin things, arranging my finances, responding to emails, fixing templates that were broken, giving advice to people, setting up things for my stream, setting up things for my, for my YouTube videos, like not even recording or editing. Like that is such a small part of my job actually, which is wild because that's not something
something that I would ever have expected if someone told me about content creation. Maybe something that I overestimated is how much follower numbers matter. And I really had to think about this one because I don't think I'm, I always see myself as quite a realistic person. Like I don't very often overestimate something. I, I think I earlier underestimate something than overestimate something, but I think maybe I overestimated the impact of, of numbers, specifically follower numbers. Um, because I remember in my early days on Twitch or even on YouTube, I was like, oh my God, I have like two, 3000 followers or subscribers. Like that's quite a lot of people. If you think about two, 3000 people, that's a lot of people. That is not the most important metric when it comes to finding sponsors or stuff like that. And I even notice it to this day, like this YouTube channel where you're watching this video right now has had more sponsorship than my 12,000 subscriber big YouTube channel about The Sims. So like numbers, when it comes to things like sponsorships and stuff, really do not matter as much as you think. It is much more about niche and how much your audience trusts you, what your engagement rate is, like how many people actively watch your content. You you can have a million subscribers, but if you only get like a couple of thousand views on a video, your audience is not very much engaging with your content. So I feel like there's like kind of metrics behind the most visible metrics that matter so much more. And that's something that I don't think I realized when I started out creating content. And I think actually that those two things are very similar to what other people in the space would also underestimate or overestimate. I think maybe overestimation is also what I sometimes see in other people, how easy it is to do these things. Like playing games on live stream and being entertaining for three to four hours in a row, like three, four times a week. I, I think a lot of people just think, oh, that's easy, I can do that absolutely until they actually do it and then then they realize oh i really overestimated my own capabilities to be energized for four hours in a row so that's definitely something that i see with other creators of when they start streaming they're like wow i really thought you know i have endless energy i find it really easy to talk streaming is going to be not a problem and they find out that it's actually quite hard to do that and to constantly be like on literally you can't shut down when you're streaming you can't just like sit there in silence for 10 minutes even though, i mean some streamers can if you're really good at the game that you're playing but then i feel like your focus is is just not with chat but it's with the game so you're still focused and i think not being able to unfocus is something that a lot of people don't realize comes with live streaming for instance and then someone asked what is the best thing about being a content creator and what is something that you like less about it i think something that i don't really like about it is that or there's actually two things one is i'm gonna start with the negatives because <laughs> then we can get to the positives after. Uh, one thing that I don't like about it is the focus on numbers. Obviously this industry makes it really easy for you to tie your self-worth to numbers. And it's something that you have to actively daily combat in your brain. Um, and sometimes that goes really well. And some days that really doesn't go well and it sucks. And you do feel shitty when your numbers go down or something. And I think that's something that I really don't like. I wish that was different. And something else that I really don't like is that the amount of brands that take advantage of content creation Creators being solopreneurs. So like people that are solo entrepreneurs, like the fact that we don't have a legal team or the fact that there is, you know, you don't always have the most experience with signing contracts or you don't have the most experience with copyright laws or, you know, all of those things. And I have seen it in the past three years on like creator Twitter, in my own experience, talking to creator friends is the amount of crap that companies try to push on us of requesting insane amounts of work for absolutely no money or just sending you a free product and then expecting you to make content across all your different platforms. Communication styles, um, just the sheer volume of promotion that you get in your mailbox that is really not relevant, but just because your email address is out there on the internet. Like those things I just wish was different. I wish it was like there was some sort of school that you could go to to learn all the creator basics to know about what to look for in a contract and know your self-worth when it comes to, you know, prices and setting your rates for sponsors, all of those things. Th those are things that I just don't get the most enjoyment out of that either in, in this space. So I think that is something that I definitely don't like as much. When it comes to things that I love about or like the best thing about being a content creator is I love being able to just talk about things that are passion that I'm passionate about. Like I love the fact that I love The Sims and I love productivity and I love Notion and I get to talk about all of those things for a living. I get to interact with people for a living. I get to travel the world. I've made friends from literally all over the world, from like literally every continent. I know people at this point, which is just wild to me that there are so many cool and amazing people that somehow this space of content creation connected me to. So that is definitely by far the best thing about be doing this job is being able to talk about things that I love with 
people that I love, basically. Then we get to the next segment, and that is time management and planning. I do actually want to be upfront about this, that in some answers, I might be a little bit short because I do actually have a whole separate video about how I plan and manage my content in Notion. So if you're ever interested in like the in-depth answers of how I do this, so feel free to go check that out. I'll make sure to link it in the cart and then the description box down below. But I'm going to like try to kind of get through this without going into too much detail, because again, I want to prevent this video from being like six hours long. The first question is, how do you manage content creation and life things with a chronic illness? Actually, at the time when this video comes out, I have made a whole video about this. So I will again link that up in the cards in the description box down below. It's not meant to just send you in circles, but I just feel like I that's such an important question that I can't cover it all in today's video. But I think this is for me, it's a very much a learning process. I am definitely not saying I have all the answers because there is days where I don't manage it. Very frankly put, there is days where I just suck at it and I go far beyond my own boundaries. And then I realize that I shouldn't have because I get really tired or I don't feel well after. Uh, but I think the most important thing for me is a part of being able to do content creation for me is actually a solution for the things that I experience with my chronic illness because I actually experience a lot of pain. So for me, going to an office, for instance, is something that I struggle with a lot. Having to like be in an environment that I can't control all day takes a lot of my energy. Whereas when I'm working from home and I'm creating content, I can move around my schedule to kind of fit my energy needs and I can make sure that I don't have to travel for it or I, I only go outdoors when I feel like I have the energy for it. So I can control my day much more. So in that sense, I would say that actually content creation is almost an outcome to a problem rather than something that I have to figure out how to kind of balance out too much because I, I had to figure that out in the outside world much more than I have right now as a content creator. But it's definitely something that I have to keep in mind. Um, I try to be honest with myself in terms of when I need help, when there's something I can't do myself. Uh, I'm really glad that I get to work with uh, amazing people, moderators, editors, um, people that help me out with brainstorming, my friends. Like there's so many people that I can rely on when are when I feel like I need some help or I just need to vent to someone. So I feel like those are all really important foundations. But like, again, for all the practicalities of like, how do I actually plan everything? Um, I would greatly advise you to watch that other video because there I also share everything about like the tools that I use and stuff to facilitate that. Then the next one is, do you have any advice for maintaining a good work-life balance as a content creator? And I wish I did, but my answer is very much no, because I think my work-life balance is non-existent. <laughs> And I say that kind of with a smile because I feel like my my biggest challenge, and I know that's such a luxury problem, is that a lot of things that come with the job of being a content creator, making Instagram posts, making nice pictures, thinking about reels, coming up with scripts, coming up with ideas, like all of these things don't feel like work to me. I enjoy doing those so much. Obviously there's things that I don't enjoy, like answering emails and stuff that, that feels like work. And I try to do this as much as I can in business hours. Like that's my rule. I, I work during the day from nine to five. That's the time where I do all of those things. But sometimes I have a night off and I'm like, oh, I really feel like redoing all my Twitch panels, like for fun, even though technically it's related to my content creation. So I think this is something that in that sense, my, my work-life balance is non-existent because so many things that I do for content creation, I do in my private time simply because I enjoy them and I don't think they feel like work. So I wish I had good advice for you on this one, but frankly, I don't, I think. Maybe I do. I'll think about it. If I come up with something later or I do realize I actually have some things about this, this would be a very interesting topic to maybe for me to give it some more thought and make a separate video about. Then the next question is, how far ahead do you plan your content? I would say two months, but that is very much like conceptually. So whenever I get to like, I kind of work two weeks ahead. Currently this video, I'm working on it right now. I'm recording it now. It is supposed to air like in one and a half weeks. So I think in that sense, actual creation is two weeks ahead so that I I never feel like I'm constantly working against my own deadlines. Sometimes things are going very well and I'm actually working a month ahead, but then I very often notice that the things that I plan for a month ahead, there is just some things that come up in between of like events that people invite me to, uh, sponsors that want to work with me. Uh, maybe someone wants to like offline, someone wants to meet up and I have to reschedule a stream or something. So the further I plan ahead and, and like actually set it in stone, the harder it becomes for me to be flexible with it. So I always try to work two weeks ahead, but in my content creation calendar, I have at least two months of content planned as in like video ideas that are scheduled for those days. So that whenever I get to that moment of I have to work two weeks ahead, 
I never have to think about what am I going to make, but I still maintain that freedom and flexibility of shuffling things around when things in life come up, opportunities come up that I want to seize. Then the next question is, what does your weekly schedule look like? Are you super scheduled or more random? Do you work in weekly cycles or something different? I am highly scheduled to a degree where I don't think the word spontaneity exists in my in my dictionary. I am extremely planned. That's how I like to live my life. I think it's a coping mechanism for my ADHD to be extremely structured. My weekly schedule is uh, very similar every single week. So I'm very much a scheduled person. My schedule is very similar routine wise. I always try to keep my Sunday afternoon and my Saturday free so that I can meet up with friends. I can do my household chores. I can hang out with my partner. I try to keep my Tuesdays and my Thursdays night free as well, because then again, I can hang out with my partner. I can just kind of relax, read a book, watch a film, all of those things. So that's very much my free time. And I try to keep this routine as much as possible because the more I am in my routine, the better I perform. So that is something that I very much like. And like I said earlier, I try to, I'm like actively working on content for this week and next week. And then anything that comes after, usually I don't work on unless there is something like a sponsor or a big event, then obviously I'm planning further ahead. For instance, it, when I'm recording this video, it's May. I am very much working on a big event in November already, but that's because it's such a big event. It requires months of planning. Then the next question is what challenges do you face juggling the responsibilities of content management and streaming and how do you overcome them? I think we've talked about many already earlier in the video, but I'm trying to figure out if there's something that I haven't mentioned yet. I think the first one that just comes to mind right now is the the fact that this is when it comes to like time spent versus income gained from it, it is not a lucrative business, or at least it isn't until you're at a certain point of how big you are. Because if your accounts or like your engagement is big enough, if your name is big enough, if you've like really truly build a brand for yourself, then you can get to a point where sponsorships and opportunities and events and stuff start generate enough for you to be a full-time streamer or full-time content creator. But I think a lot of people don't realize how much work it takes to get there, unless you're extremely lucky and you blow up overnight, which very rarely happens. It takes a lot Lot of hours and a lot of work to get there and how to overcome them i wish i knew <laughs> I think for me, again, I'm very much enjoying the process of getting there. So that is something that is helping me a lot. I would love to do this full time one day, but right now that would not be viable for me income wise, even though it's becoming more and more and more viable, like every step of the way. Two years ago, it wasn't even something that I was considering or hoping for. And at this point, I'm kind of like, OK, I think I could make it happen, but there's definitely a long way to get there. And I, I think the most important advice for me would be to if you don't enjoy, enjoy the journey of getting there, you're not going to enjoy the end result either, because even if you're at the end result, you're going to have to do a lot of work to keep that up. So how to overcome them? I think unless the creator industry drastically changes, which I don't expect it to do anytime soon, uh, is kind of just accept it and find your your flow in that creator space. Then the next one is, can you share a memorable experience where your skills as a project manager directly influence your success as a streamer or vice versa? And then there's like a couple of sub questions that kind of relate to this, where people were like, are there any parallels between your project management job and your streaming or content creation job? Um, is there any skills that you have a as a project manager that translate into your approach? Um, very much, I think to all of these questions, there is a huge overlap. And I think I've actually, as of this year, rec recently like realized how much potential there is in that overlap because creative people tend to not be the most organized people and extremely organized people tend to usually not be the most creative people. I'm not saying that's a black and white situation because obviously there's nuances. I'm a walking example of the fact that it does come in both. But in I think in a sense, if you were to make it very stereotypical, then creative people are usually people that struggle with planning and organization and execution. And then there is like a lot of people that are like extremely well organized, extremely good at executing and like kind of almost working like a factory. But because of that, it's hard for them to be creative. And I think I really love the fact that these are two things I can do and that I get to be and a content creator and a project manager. And I kind of like get to combine those two aspects of my personality. I think if I had to come up with like a really memorable example. And um, so for instance, last year I hosted a huge charity event on my live stream for November, which we ended up raving, raising over $7,000 in a month, which is absolutely beyond me how we did that. I'm so grateful. But I think a part of why that worked out so well is because I already started planning that event months ahead. I came up with incentives that I had to 
order stuff for. I made sure that I had contact with Movember themselves. I was in touch with Twitch for them to be able to be featured on the front page for like the last week. I actually got my work, like my project management work to also donate or like even match donations for my community. And like all of these things, if I didn't have the organizational skills or the knowledge of how corporates work, I would have never even thought to reach out to Movember or to reach out to Twitch or to even ask for matching donations from the company that I work for. So I feel like that is one very tangible example where I think the event was such a, such a success because it was well organized and I could never have done that without my project management skills in place. And I think also it kind of translates the other way around as well. I have noticed that I've gotten a lot better at stakeholder management in my project management job since I started creating content because I understand much more of community building and communication like kind of direct versus broadcasting and you know like all of these nuances that you have when you are operating in a space that heavily built itself on community and networking and I definitely take that knowledge back to my project management job as well so it's I would say they kind of influence each other very strongly and so far also mostly in a positive manner I think the most challenging thing is that for both jobs it requires a lot of my brain power to memorize things to plan things out so sometimes that can be challenging because my head feels very very full all of the time then the next section that we get to in this video is live streaming and someone asked as a live streamer how do you handle audience interaction and feedback effectively and that's a, such an interesting question because i think it very much touches upon the topic that i also mentioned earlier about community building and communication and stuff and i think this is something that i find wildly interesting because I sometimes find it hard to pinpoint like what are the things that I'm doing right that are like working and what are the things that maybe I should have done differently because some things come intuitively some things are just experiments I very much also look at other people what they do and kind of see hey I see them you know doing this or like posting this or interacting this way with people in their YouTube comments on Twitter all of those things and I kind of figure out who I want to be in that. I think when it comes to feedback, I always try to have an open mind when someone wants to give me feedback. Uh, obviously, it depends on how they give that feedback. If, if their first ever message in my Twitch stream is like, hey, your mic sucks and your camera is ugly. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll probably not take that as constructive constructive criticism and I'll just be like goodbye but whenever people come into my YouTube comments and like hey it would be great if you did this or this next time because I think it would help I would I always love to hear about these things because I think it's great that people even take the time out of their day to give me feedback and to kind of think with me on how I could improve my content I always try to have an open mind on this obviously sometimes people can be really rude and that makes it hard to uh, always have an open mind. And when it comes to audience interaction, I, th I think for me, the most important lesson here is learning to set boundaries because obviously parasocial relationships are very much a thing on any platform these days, not just YouTube or Twitch. It's very much on Instagram and TikTok and all of those places. People start to feel like they know you because they watch hours of your content. And in the beginning, it was really easy for me to interact with everyone. Like it was easy for me to interact with everyone commenting on my YouTube. YouTube videos with everyone in my streams, with everyone on my TikTok, because the volume of people was just much smaller. And it was also a lot of the same people coming from like Twitch to YouTube to TikTok, like kind of showing up on every platform. I very much noticed over the past six months that I've simply not been able to keep up and I've not been able to foster like a very close knit relationship with every single person that I meet. So for me, I've, I've been very much learning and developing, like how do I set healthy boundaries for myself? Um, do I have my DMs open for people? Uh, how do I want to collaborate with people? This is very much a learning process for me as well, but I think setting boundaries and, and also firmly setting them and saying, hey, I'm not accepting friend requests from people that I don't know, or I'm not gonna help people fix their Sims game, or like these kind of boundaries that I found harder to set in the beginning have definitely, uh, is definitely a learning curve that I'm very much on right now because I have to set them to keep my own time my own, you know? The next question is, how did you get into co-working streams? Do you have tips for people who want to start doing them? I'm gonna start with the second part of that question because just like any tip for streaming content creation is just do it. Start with them and see if you like it. And then if you do start investing time in figuring out what bot to use and how to set up commands and all of those things. But first start with just you trying to do a live stream. See if you can work while you're live streaming. See if it's something that your brain is okay with because you can do all the research and then hit that go live button and realize it's not for you. And don't then, then it genuinely feels like wasted time. So that would be my main tip that goes for gameplay streams as well, by the way. And how did I get into co-working streams? 
I fell in love with co-working streams during COVID when I was working a lot from home. I think it was 2021 somewhere uh, where I found study time, um, the mother of co-working, <laughs> I always call her. Um, and uh, I watched her streams a lot. I think she's amazing. She she is such an inspirational person. Also to see her kind of go from student to being someone who's working and doing co-working streams. And at one point I kind of felt like, hey, I have, I've been in her stream so much. Is this something that I could potentially do as well? And like I said, I kind of just tried it out. And at that point I realized, well, this works even better. Like hosting a co-working stream is even more effective than being in one. So let me just start doing this and adding it to my content. And then I found out that the community loved it as well. And I just never stopped. And then the last question in this category is, how do you approach collaboration with other streamers or content creators to expand your audience reach? And I think this is an interesting question because it kind of has two parts for me. One is how do you approach collaboration? And the second part is specifically to reach new audiences. And I think obviously when you collaborate with other streamers, you get introduced to their audience as well. But I think that to me has never been my main goal goal of collaboration. So I've done a couple of collaborations in terms of like doing a panel on TwitchCon with Happy and Amber. Um, I have met up with creators just as friends to like grab a coffee or something that wasn't really collaborating, but obviously you get closer, which means that it's easier to talk to each other when you see each other in chat and stuff or in YouTube comments or stuff like that. Also very much the part of like, I have creators that inspire me greatly. So being able to introduce them to my community, it's almost like the other way around where, for instance, I did a co-working stream with a good friend of mine, Justin, who creates ambient music and live layered ASMR. And I asked him if he wanted to provide live music for a co-working stream, but that wasn't necessarily because I was looking to get introduced to his audience. It was mostly because I wanted to introduce my audience and my community to the amazing work that Justin is doing. And I thought we had a great kind of overlap where we could be like kind of showcasing each other, but that was mostly my motivation wasn't necessarily to get introduced to a bigger audience. So I think in that sense, for me, the goal is very different in collaboration. And I think that's also the approach with which I go into proposing collaborations or like figuring out collaborations. I've done a great collaboration with Jess where we did a build challenge in The Sims. That was mostly for me personally, it was so much for fun. Like Jess is a great friend of mine, just asked if I wanted to join. Building, collaboratively building in The Sims is just hilarious and so much fun. And, and then we kind of just did it. And I very much have as my goal that I want to do more collaborations. And I definitely like the idea of creative collaborations where maybe like we, like I did with Justin and the co-working and like the live music, that isn't the most straightforward collaboration. Like that isn't the first thing one would think of when it comes to collaborating with other content creators. So I have a couple of ideas in my brain that I'm currently working on. And uh, I hope to be able to share more of these collaborations throughout the year because I'm very excited for all of this. And then we get to the last category and I'm a very afraid that this video is going to be long anyways, but I hope that the fact that I split it up into different segments allows you to kind of skip ahead to the segments that are relevant for you. But we're going to get to the last uh, official one, and then we are going to end the video with a couple of random questions, which is strategies. And I think actually some of these strategies we have already touched upon in everything I've mentioned before. So one is, can you share some tips for creating consistent brand identity across your content and streaming channels? The answer is yes. And my, it's very simple. Pick a font and pick a color scheme. It doesn't have to be the exact same, like as in you don't have to have the exact same banner everywhere and the exact same logo everywhere. Actually, you don't even need a logo at all, but make sure that your font and your colors are recognizable. And if you can make sure that you can use the same username everywhere. I feel like this to me, I started out with a different username on many platforms. At this point, I have two usernames that are kind of like intertwined with each other. So my main username is Rosanna TXT. That's me. That's where I create content as an individual. And then I have extra TXT and that is for all of my extra text for anything that I want to share that doesn't directly correlate with The Sims or gaming, AKA the channel that you're watching right now. And the next question is, what's the best way you have found to grow a following? What do you think was the most important thing you did for your growth on Twitch and YouTube? I think there's a couple of things that contribute to this. Uh, one, I feel like I put a lot of effort in interacting with the community, uh, both on my YouTube channel. I make sure to respond to every single comment if I can. Some comments I genuinely don't know what to respond to, so then I don't say anything, but I then at least I try to give it a heart or make sure that someone knows that I've seen their comment. On Twitch, I try to always welcome in people to the stream. I try to remember their names, as in like, 
the actual nickname that they tell me that they prefer to be called. I try to remember maybe like where someone's from, what their favorite food is, like all the little things they tell me to make sure that someone feels like they're personally seen. Um, and that makes people feel welcome and part of a bigger community and makes them want to come back to your stream, hopefully, or, or content creator like YouTube. Uh, something else that I found is make sure that you deliver value. And that can be in the form of entertainment, that can be in the form of education, but make sure that there's something that someone is getting out of the things that you're sharing with them. Uh, because by just sharing something like your four hour long recording of you playing a game where you're not talking, like what would a person get out of watching that? Maybe a little bit of entertainment, um, but most people are used to high paced, like very high edited videos these days to keep them entertained. So that's something that you just kind of have to keep in the back of your mind of is the thing that I'm putting out there on the internet creating value for someone? If the answer is no, then probably you're not gonna grow a following from that. Um, and that's just a harsh, harsh truth. And even I have to learn from that some days where I realize that the things that I'm making are just not beneficial to anyone. And that's also okay, as long as I enjoy the process, but then you're not gonna grow a following, I, I would say. Then what strategies do you use to keep your content fresh and engaging for your audience across different platforms? I think never stop learning. Make sure that my skills keep evolving, make sure that I get better at editing, make sure that I get better at camera skills, make sure that I get better at talking into a microphone. Just just in general, watch other people's content to get inspired by. Make sure that you don't get lazy with your content because people will see that. People will start to notice if you continuously create the same thing over and over again, then it's probably not gonna be engaging for them to watch. So make sure that they can see. They can see that you're evolving. They can see that you're growing. They can see that you're investing time and potentially money if you want to, but mostly your time and your efforts into continuously developing as a person. And that can be really small things. You don't have to spend a whole lot of money and like change your entire background, for instance. I only ever did that after three years of creating content, but it can also be like really small things of, of getting a little bit better at talking to a camera. Then the next question is, how do you create your vision for your content? I feel like you always, you're always evolving. And I think it's so cool to see your vision come to like, like your process in your creative direction. I know who asked this question and that's very interesting. It's actually my best friend who asked this question. Um, and I think it's really fun Funny because right before this question was asked, we talked about like my backdrop and how I had a vision for what I wanted when I changed my background and how that vision kind of like came to life. I think a big part of this is just how my brain works. So I don't really know how to describe it. I think that's just like the creative part that I was always missing to put to use in any of my other jobs is my brain. I'm a very like visual person. So I sometimes like just see things and then all of a sudden I'm like, oh crap, that that's what I want. And then sometimes I even struggle to find like pictures of what I'm trying, what I already see in my brain to make sure that other people can visualize it too. But I think for my content, I just, I allow myself to get very inspired by other people and also try to not watch content in just one niche. I very much enjoy aesthetic and soft lifestyle content. I very much enjoy productivity content. I enjoy gaming content. I enjoy a, like a variety of gaming content. Uh, I like live streams. I like TikTok. So kind of like immersing myself in other people's content and seeing what they're doing and kind of like trying to maybe take something from productivity content and like implement it into gaming content so that people People in the gaming space will probably find it very fresh and new whereas i didn't even come up with it because it was very much like borrowed or inspired by someone else then the next question is how do you diversify where your income is coming from did you start those in the beginning or have they evolved when did you know it was time to start something new that's a really good question if you want to know exactly what I all have income from, I have a full video on this YouTube channel where I actually share everything. I'm like 100% transparent about my income, where it came from, how much I earned in 2023. So uh, I highly recommend checking that out if that's something that you're interested in. I definitely diversify my content. I think for content creation, if I had to mention at this point, all of my streams, it's like six or seven different income streams a month, which can be hard to keep track of sometimes. But I try to definitely make sure that it doesn't come from just one place, which sometimes is hard because it spreads your attention like really thin across all of the platforms or all of the assignments or projects that you're working on. But it is simply not viable in content creation space, or at least not for many to only get all your income from live streaming. Unfortunately, that would be nice, but that's just not the case. I definitely did not start all of them in the beginning. I started my entire 
journey of like when I look at the things that I'm monetizing, so not my social media platforms, but like the things that actually actively earn me money, I started with Twitch. That was the only thing that generated any money in the whole first year of me streaming uh, or creating content. My YouTube channel at the time wasn't partnered, so I was only getting a little bit from Twitch and I made sure to reinvest all of that money into better equipment and stuff to continue to create content. At this point, I have Actually, I'm hoping for this specific YouTube channel to monetize soon because then I would have two monetized YouTube channels. I sell Notion templates, so selling a digital product. I live stream still. I work with sponsors. And these are all things that I gradually added over time. And I think the main advice to, to anyone is like, when are, am I ready for that? Is when it comes to like sponsorships and stuff is don't wait too long. You don't have to be a really big channel to get sponsorships. So please don't worry too much about your numbers. But I think the most important thing is, are you and your process and your time ready to take on more work? Because an adding a new income stream, especially in the beginning, takes a lot of time and energy. So if you're not ready for that right now, if you've already feel overwhelmed with everything you're doing, don't add an extra income stream to it because it's just going to overcomplicate things. And that's what I've been doing over the past three years. I've like been slowly working towards more and more and more, but I only add something as soon as the previous thing that I'm doing is like ingrained in my process and scalable so that I can do it like kind of routinely without having to think about it too much. The next question is, how do you stay updated with trends in content creation and streaming platforms to adapt your strategies accordingly? I spend too much time on the internet. That's my honest answer. I wish there was a more effective way to do this because spending a lot of time in other people's streams, other people's YouTube videos, etc., is very tiring. Um, I think if that is a part that I could take out of my content creation, I would absolutely love to because I love seeing my friends and I love interacting with them. So that's not the part that I want to get rid of. But the part of scrolling on Instagram and TikTok for hours to find videos that inspire me to create new reels or like looking at people's pictures or obsessing over my analytics because I'm trying to find that like one clue about my posting times or my title or like my thumbnail, trying to do A-B tests with thumbnails and titles to kind of change them after a couple of hours to see if the engagement goes up. Like all of these things, I wish I could take them out, but those are very effective in spotting trends. So I, at this point in time, I don't really know how to stop doing them, but that's how I stay updated. I'm chronically online. The next one is, can you discuss the importance of community building in both content management and streaming? And how do you foster a supportive and interactive community around your brand? So again, this question is kind of like twofold. One the importance it's in ex extremely important um just like with any brand your community are your customers you want to make sure that they're happy you want to make sure that they find your space enjoyable and you want to make sure that they feel seen that they feel heard that they feel taken seriously and that they're getting value out of whatever you're doing so in that sense creating content is not different to running any business it's a transaction and it's kind of different because you're not really like not someone is paying you money and you're giving them a physical product but it's very much a transaction of time and resources spent into your content from your side and from the other side so community building is extremely important just like it is with any other business as well and then when it comes to how do you foster a supportive and interactive community around your brand i think again kind of like with any brand uh figuring out what your own values are and what kind of community you want to foster is a great starting point because if you don't know what you want to allow in your space, it's gonna be really easy for people to take advantage of that leeway. If you know what your values are, if you know what your rules are, if you know what you stand for, you're gonna actually attract people that are in a similar space in life. So for instance, in my chat, I very much do not tolerate bullying. I do not tolerate people being discriminating. I want to make sure that people that are a part of any minority group feel safe in my chat and that we can openly talk about things. So I don't shy away from like harder conversations around politics or uh, ethnics or discrimination or stuff like that, as long as we keep it respectful. That's like such an important ground rule for me is we can talk about the hard topics. We can also agree to disagree. I don't want to foster a community where I force everyone to have the exact same opinion, but the conversation around it needs to stay respectful from all sides involved. And if you don't act respectfully, you're out. And I think that helps a lot because it gives people a lot of guidance on how they 
are supposed to behave to make sure that the community can thrive when it's small, but also when it grows bigger and bigger and bigger. And people that come into the stream will notice that that is like the community that you're fostering. So I think in the end, a lot of it comes down to what you want it to be and how you make sure that those boundaries are set in place. That immediately makes it very hard and very taxing because that means that it's your sole responsibility what your community is like. And also when your community is acting in a way that you actually don't like, it is your job to speak up and that can be really tough. Then the next question is, what steps did you take to keep up with emerging platforms or features that could enhance your content and streaming experience? I think I have to admit that lately I've kind of been dropping the ball on this because I noticed that it takes a lot of my mental capacity to continuously keep learning about new features and like, hey, Instagram added this new thing, which is gonna completely boost your, your uh, post in the algorithm or when YouTube shorts became a thing and then all of a sudden like TikTok started pushing videos that were longer and YouTube shorts couldn't be longer than one minute. And some of these things can be really overwhelming at times. I think the most important lesson here for me is it is okay if you can't do it all at the same time. I do try to learn about it just by watching other people's content that like people that know about this, that talk about this a lot. How do the algorithms work? What are like things that you can keep in mind to kind of maximize your success? So again, I'm very, very much leaning on other people in this space to also help me out. And I kind of hope that for instance, with this specific YouTube channel, I can kind of give back some things that might be my strength and might, you know, people could benefit from my experience. So because I have been benefiting hugely from other people's experience and other people providing free educational content when it comes to exactly this. Then the next one is how do you approach the repurposing of content across different platforms to maximize reach and impact? I wish I was better at this, to be honest. Um, I think, for instance, my Twitch streams have could have many more clips that I could probably capitalize on when it comes to other platforms. At the same time, I also very much enjoy the process of creating content. So I don't always want to recycle all of my stuff because I like making authentic new stuff. Uh, I have recently been trying to do something smart where I figured out a couple of my YouTube videos could be very easily cut down into educational shorts for The Sims. And I've been doing that, which means basically my entire Sims TikTok right now is just reused content from my YouTube, which is great because TikTok is great for discoverability like that. And then I also post them as YouTube shorts with the hopes that people that see the short might end up clicking on the whole video video and might discover my channel like that. So I think I've been trying to do this, but I can definitely do this better. I think eventually it might be really nice if I could work more with like external people. So more editors and stuff to help me out on actually editing down that content. So it doesn't feel recycled. It feels fresh because of like little zooms or effects or sounds and stuff like that. I have been getting better at recording things that happen on stream and then turning it into a YouTube video. And that actually recently led to a YouTube video kind of popping off on my Sims channel, which definitely contributed to reaching 10K there. So um, I'm getting better at it, but it's definitely a journey. Then the next question is, what role do analytics play in your decision-making process when it comes to refining your content and streaming strategies? They definitely do play a role, sometimes more so in ruining my mental health than in actual strategies for my content. But I think something that does intrigue me is figuring out like on a stream, is, is there a moment where like my viewership drops what did I do at that point in time? Not necessarily to never do that again. As I'm trying to build a community and an engaging stream, it is interesting to just look at, hey, I noticed that my viewership dropped at like this specific time in my stream with 20, 25 viewers. Like what happened there? Why did 25 individual people decide to click off at this time? Was it like a topic that we were discussing? Was there a specific vibe in the chat? Was it because I was on a very long break? Like what happened there? And I tried to learn from that, absolutely. And I tried to learn from watching back my own YouTube videos i tried to learn from watching back my own streams so that's not even analytic stuff that's just being open to feedback from yourself i would say and i think analytics do play a part in strategy i've definitely looked at my youtube videos and like tried to figure out what type of content what type of titles all of those things would work the best to grow my channel but i try to not let it dictate everything i do i try to always put the fact that i'm enjoying creating content at number one and all the other things come second then the last question in this category is i'd be curious to know if you plan to live stream on youtube at the same time as twitch and what your thoughts are about streaming on two platforms that is such an interesting question because 
at this point, I have to be honest, I don't fully know. I've been kind of having the itch to potentially try multi-streaming because it's now allowed. Twitch changed its policies uh, last year in the summer that you are allowed to multi-stream to both Twitch and YouTube at the same time. And I know there is probably a bunch of people who watch my YouTube channel at this point that have never heard of Twitch or are not even on Twitch. Maybe they know of it, but they are not on the platform itself. So I think at this point, my YouTube channel could be big enough to try this. I do know that YouTube is definitely not the easiest place either to get discovered as a live streamer. So I would always probably stream at the same time on both platforms. I would have to see how that works out with engagement and chat and if I wouldn't get overwhelmed and all of those things. So it, I would probably treat it as an experiment and maybe like for one month long, try to stream on both platforms, maybe do one YouTube stream where I'm only doing a YouTube stream and kind of see how things go. I feel like that's kind of how everyone at this point is, is working with it. Everyone's trying to experiment, finding their flow, seeing if it brings any value to them. But I think it's only valuable if you already have a good audience on your YouTube channel. If your YouTube channel is very small, even though YouTube was supposed to have far more discoverability than Twitch, I think for live streaming, they're running into the exact same problem. So yeah. I, th that's my thoughts for now. Um, if I do ever end up running that experiment, I might make a separate video on it and share my findings with you on this channel as well. And then uh, lastly, there is three quite random questions that I still wanted to answer. The first one is, are you excited for TwitchCon 2024? And the answer is absolutely. Um, I'm going to both TwitchCon. So if you're ever interested in hanging out with me or vibing or anything, and you're also uh, from Twitch, feel free to come say hi to me uh, at TwitchCon and Rotterdam or at TwitchCon in San Diego because I'm going to go to both of them this year and I'm super stoked to meet so many of you again. It's one of my favorite times of the year so I cannot wait. What's your favorite project that I made? And I think when I look back at everything that I've made in the past three years, um, I love so many things that I've done. But one of the things that I'm really, really proud of is the Pack Legacy Challenge. It's a uh, legacy challenge for The Sims. It's one of those things that I just never really expected for myself to do because I'm definitely, I'm a storyteller, but I'm not a writer. I don't like writing. I love coming up with stories and, and, you know, sharing them while playing a game, but I'm not a person who writes them down. And the Pack Legacy Challenge is at this point a 29 long generation legacy challenge, which required a lot of writing. It's definitely one of those things where I kind of went beyond what I thought I could do with content. So I'm really proud of that one. And it's it's really cool to see that so many people are enjoying playing that challenge because it's, it's definitely something that if you had told me a couple of years ago that I would have created a Sims Legacy Challenge that many people would be playing, I don't think I would have believed you. So that's one thing that I'm really proud of. Um, and then the last question, and I purposely put this at the end because I thought it was such a funny question. And I also know who asked this question is one of my dear friends. One of my dear friends asked, how are you amazing at everything you do? And I think first and foremost, I'm definitely not. Let's let's break that myth. You guys are just seeing all the good stuff and <laughs> not all the bad stuff. I think that was, it was a really sweet question. And I think with that, I just wanted to kind of reverse that question and ask that to anyone who watches my videos, anyone who's part of my community. How are all of you so amazing? And, and how am I so lucky that I get to have so many cool people that watch my content, that interact with my stuff, that are always like my biggest cheerleaders for whatever idiotic idea I have from like putting a pancake with whipped cream in my face to eating the sourest candy in the world to, you know, like going to the Movember award show on a whim. Like there's just so many things in my life that I don't think I would have ever done had I not started this content creation journey. So my question would be, how are you guys amazing at everything you do? Because I don't think I would be here if it weren't for you guys. So huge shout out, huge thank you. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this almost most full hour of me yapping. I probably, when I cut this video down, it's still going to be ridiculously long. Thank you all so much for watching. Thank you for allowing me to have content creation be part of my job because I couldn't do that without all of you. And if this is the first video that you ever see from me, consider supporting me on the journey by subscribing to this channel. So checking out my other content on all of my other platforms. And with all of that being said, don't forget to toss a cheeky like, and thank you so much for watching. I'll see you on the next one. Bye everyone.